The Family, excerpted from Time on the Cross, The Economics of American Negro Slavery, by Robert Fogel and Stanley Ingerman. This book was originally published in 1974. The Family. The administration of most large plantations was based on two organizations. Field work revolved around gangs. They were the vehicle through which planters were able to achieve a degree of specialization and efficiency that was unmatched elsewhere in agriculture. This aspect of plantation organization is considered in Chapter 6. The other organization of central importance was the family. Planters assigned three functions to the slave family. First, it was the administrative unit for the distribution of food and clothing and for the provision of shelter. As we have already seen, the single-family house, not the dormitory, was almost the universal form of shelter on larger plantations. The records of planters also indicate that whether food was cooked in a common kitchen or in the house of individual families, allotments of rations were generally made by family. The same was true for clothing. The family was also an important instrument for maintaining labor discipline. By encouraging strong family attachments, slave owners reduced the danger that individual slaves would run away. By permitting families to have de facto ownership of houses, furniture, clothing, garden plots, and small livestock, planters created an economic stake for slaves in the system. Moreover, the size of the stake was variable. It was possible for some families to achieve substantially higher levels of income and of de facto wealth ownership than others. The size and quality of houses and the allotments of clothes, as well as the size of the garden plots, differed from family to family. Third, the family was also the main instrument for promoting the increase of the slave population. Not only did planters believe that fertility rates would be highest when the family was strongest, but they relied on the family for the rearing of children. Although infants and very young children were kept in nurseries while mothers labored in the field, these supplemented rather than replaced the family. The central importance of the family in the rearing of slaves is revealed by the narratives of former slaves collected by the WPA in the 1930s. In discussing their early upbringing and the influences on them, the former slaves frequently refer to what their parents taught them, but rarely, if ever, invoke the names of women who ran the nurseries. To promote the stability of slave families, planters often combined exhortations with a system of rewards and sanctions. The rewards included such subsidies as separate houses for married couples, gifts of household goods, and cash bonuses. They often sought to make the marriage a solemn event by embedding it in a well-defined ritual. Some marriage ceremonies were performed in churches, others by the planter in the big house. In either case, marriages were often accompanied by feasts and sometimes made the occasion for a general holiday. The sanctions were directed against adultery and divorce. For many planters, Adultery was an offense which required whippings for the guilty parties. Some planters also used the threat of the whip to discourage divorce. Thus, while the existence of slave marriages was explicitly denied under the legal codes of the states, they were not only recognized but actively promoted under plantation codes. That the legal basis for slave marriage was derived from codes which held sway within the jurisdiction of the plantation points to a much neglected feature of legal structure in the antebellum South. Within fairly wide limits, the state, in effect, turned the definition of the codes of legal behavior of slaves and of the punishment for infractions of these codes over to planters. Such duality of the legal structure was not unique in the antebellum South. It existed in medieval Europe, in the duality between the law of the manor and of the crown. It was a characteristic of the regimes under which the American colonies were governed, 
and in lesser degree it exists with respect to certain large institutions today. For example, with respect to university regulations. The importance of the dual legal structure for the antebellum South is that the latitude which the state yielded to the planter was quite wide. For most slaves, it was the law of the plantation, not of the state, that was relevant. Only a small proportion of the slaves ever had to deal with the law enforcement mechanism of the state. Their daily lives were governed by plantation law. Consequently, the emphasis put on the sanctity of the slave family by many planters and the legal status given to the slave family under plantation law cannot be lightly dismissed. Recognition of the dualistic nature of the southern legal structure puts into a different perspective the emphasis which some historians have placed on the pre-bourgeois character of antebellum society. What made that society pre-bourgeois was not the absence of a commercial spirit among planters, but the wide area of legal authority which the state yielded to them. In Europe, the rise of capitalism was accompanied by a determined struggle to weaken the authority of the manor and to transfer its powers to the centralized state. This process was sharply curtailed in the South. While the South developed a highly capitalistic form of agriculture, and while its economic behavior was as strongly ruled by profit maximization as that of the North, the relationship between its ruling and its servile class was marked by patriarchal features, which were strongly reminiscent of medieval life. Unlike the northern manufacturer, the authority of the planter extended not only to the conduct of business, but to the regulation of the family lives of slaves, the control of their public behavior, the provision of their food and shelter, the care of their health, and the protection of their souls. We do not mean to suggest that planters viewed the slave family purely as a business instrument. Victorian attitudes predominated in the planting class. The emphasis on strong, stable families and on the limitation of sexual activity to the family followed naturally from such attitudes. That morality and good business practice should coincide created neither surprise nor consternation among most planters. Of course, not all planters and not all of their overseers were men who lived by the moral codes of their day. That many of these men sought sex outside the confines of their wives' beds is beyond question. To satisfy their desires, they took on mistresses and concubines, seduced girls of tender ages, and patronized prostitutes. Such sexual exploitation was not limited to the South, and within the South, sexual exploitation by white men was not limited to black women. The point at issue here is not whether the sexual exploitation of slave women by masters and overseers existed, but whether it was so frequent that it undermined or destroyed the black family. Let us pose the question somewhat more sharply. Are there reasons to believe that the degree of sexual exploitation which white men imposed on black women was greater than that imposed on white women? We put the issue in this way because while the sexual exploitation of white women was rife, few have gone so far as to claim that such exploitation destroyed the family institution among whites. Is the asymmetry in the presumed effects of sexual exploitation on the families of blacks and whites justified by available evidence? Antebellum critics of slavery answered these questions in the affirmative. They accused slaveholders and overseers of turning plantations into personal harems. They assumed that because the law permitted slave owners to ravish black women, the practice must have been extremely common. They also assumed that black women were, if not more licentious, at least more promiscuous than white women, and hence less likely to resist sexual advances by men, whether black or white. Moreover, the ravishing of black women by white men was not the only aspect of sexual exploitation which devastated the slave family. There was also the policy of deliberate slave breeding, under which planters encouraged promiscuous relationships among blacks. 
thus economic greed and lust on the part of the planters and submissiveness on the part of the slaves combined to make the sexual exploitation of black women so extreme as to be beyond comparison with the situation of white women. The evidence on which these assumptions and conclusions were based was extremely limited. While none of the various travelers through the South had seen deliberate slave breeding practiced, they had all heard reports of it. Some travelers published conversations with men who admitted to fathering a large number of slaves on their plantations. Others wrote of a special solicitude shown by one or another master to mulatto offspring, a solicitude which in their minds strongly implied parenthood. There were also the descriptions of the treatment of especially pretty slave women on the auction block and of the high prices at which such women sold, prices too high to be warranted by field labor and which could be explained only by their value as concubines or as prostitutes. Even if all these reports were true, they constituted, at most, a few hundred cases. By themselves, such a small number of observations out of a population of millions could just as easily be used as proof of the infrequency of the sexual exploitation of black women as of its frequency. The real question is whether such cases were common events that were rarely reported, or whether they were rare events that were frequently reported. The prevalence of mulattoes convinced not only the northern public of the antebellum era, but historians of today, that for each case of exploitation identified, there were thousands which had escaped discovery. For travelers to the south reported that a large proportion of the slaves were not the deep black of Africans from the Guinea coast, but tawny, golden, and white, or nearly white. Here was proof beyond denial of either the ubiquity of the exploitation of black women by white men, or of the promiscuity of black women, or of both. But this seemingly irrefutable evidence is far from conclusive. It is not the eyesight of these travelers to the south which is questionable, but their statistical sense for mulattoes were not distributed evenly through the Negro population. They were concentrated in the cities, and especially among freedmen. According to the 1860 census, 39% of freedmen in southern cities were mulattoes. Among urban slaves, the proportion of mulattoes was 20%. In other words, one out of every four Negroes living in a southern city was a mulatto. But among rural slaves, who constituted 95% of the slave population, only 9.9% were mulatto in 1860. For the slave population as a whole, therefore, the proportion of mulattoes was just 10.4% in 1860 and 7.7% in 1850. Thus, it appears that travelers to the South greatly exaggerated the extent of miscegenation because they came into contact with unrepresentative samples of the Negro population. They appear to have had much more contact with the freedmen and slaves of the urban areas than with slaves living in the relative isolation of the countryside. Far from proving that the exploitation of black women was ubiquitous, the available data on mulattoes strongly militates against that contention. The fact that during the 23 decades of contacts between slaves and whites which elapsed between 1620 and 1850, only 7.7% of the slaves were mulattoes, suggests that, on average, only a very small percentage of the slaves born in any given year were fathered by white men. This inference is not contradicted by the fact that the percentage of mulattoes increased by one-third during the last decade of the antebellum era, rising from 7.7 to 10.4%. For it must be remembered that mulattoes were the progeny not just of unions between whites and pure blacks, but also of unions between mulattoes and blacks. Under common definition, a person with one-eighth ancestry of another race was a mulatto. Consequently, the offspring of two slaves, who were each one-eighth white, was to be classified as a mulatto, as was the offspring of any slave, regardless of the ancestry of his or her mate, 
whose grandfather was white. A demographic model of the slave population, which is presented in the technical appendix, shows that the census data on mulattoes alone cannot be used to sustain the contention that a large proportion of slave children must have been fathered by white men. And other available bodies of evidence, such as the WPA survey of former slaves, throw such claims into doubt. Of those in the survey who identified parentage, only 4.5% indicated that one of their parents had been white. But the work of geneticists on gene pools has revealed that even the last figure may be too high. Measurements of the admixture of Caucasian and Negro genes among southern rural blacks today indicate that the share of Negro children fathered by whites on slave plantations probably averaged between 1 and 2 percent. That these findings seem startling is due in large measure to the widespread assumption that because the law permitted masters to ravish their slave women, they must have exercised that right. As one scholar recently put it, almost every white mother and wife connected with the institution of slavery either actually or potentially shared the males in her family with slave women. The trouble with this view is that it recognizes no forces operating on human behavior other than the force of statute law. Yet, many rights permitted by legal statutes and judicial decisions are not widely exercised because economic and social forces militate against them. To put the issue somewhat differently, it has been presumed that masters and overseers must have ravished black women frequently because their demand for such sexual pleasures was high and because the cost of satisfying that demand was low. Such arguments overlook the real and potentially large costs that confronted masters and overseers who sought sexual pleasures in the slave quarters. The seduction of the daughter or wife of a slave could undermine the discipline that planters so assiduously strove to attain. Not only would it stir anger and discontent in the families affected, but it would undermine the air of mystery and distinction on which so much of the authority of large planters rested. Nor was it just a planter's reputation in the slave quarter of his plantation that would be at stake. While he might be able to prevent news of his nocturnal adventures from being broadcast in his own house, it would be much more difficult to prevent his slaves from gossiping to slaves on other plantations. Owners of large plantations who desired illicit sexual relationships were by no means confined to slave quarters in their quest. Those who owned 50 or more slaves were very rich men by the standards of their day. The average annual net income in this class was in excess of $7,500. That amount was more than 60 times per capita income in 1860. To have a comparable income today, a person would need an after-tax income of about $240,000, or a before-tax income of about $600,000. So rich a man could easily have afforded to maintain a mistress in town, where his relationship could have been not only more discreet than in the crowded slave quarters of his own plantation, but far less likely to upset the labor discipline on which economic success depended. For the overseer, the cost of sexual episodes in the slave quarter, once discovered, was often his job. Nor would he find it easy to obtain employment elsewhere as an overseer, since not many masters would be willing to employ as their manager a man who is known to lack self-control on so vital an issue. Never employ an overseer who will equalize himself with a Negro woman, wrote Charles Tate to his children. Besides the morality of it, there are evils too numerous to be now mentioned. Nor should one underestimate the effects of racism on the demands of white males for black sexual partners. While some white men might have been tempted by the myth of black sexuality, a myth that may be stronger today than it was in the antebellum South, it is likely that far larger numbers were put off by racist versions. Data on prostitution supports this conjecture. Nashville is the only southern city for which a count of prostitutes is available. 
The 1860 census showed that just 4.3% of the prostitutes in that city were Negroes, although a fifth of the population of Nashville was Negro. Moreover, all of the Negro prostitutes were free and light-skinned. There were no pure blacks who were prostitutes, nor were any slaves prostitutes. The substantial underrepresentation of Negroes, as well as the complete absence of dark-skinned Negroes, indicates that white men who desired illicit sex had a strong preference for white women. The failure of Nashville's brothels to employ slave women is of special interest, for it indicates that supply as well as demand considerations served to limit the use of slaves as prostitutes. The census revealed that half of Nashville's prostitutes were illiterate, not functionally illiterate, but completely lacking in either the capacity to read or to write, or both. In other words, the supply of prostitutes was drawn from poor, uneducated girls who could only command the wages of unskilled labor. Given such a supply, a slaveholder did not have to be imbued with Victorian morals to demur from sending his chattel into prostitution. He could clearly earn more on his slave women by working them in the fields, where they could not be subject to the high morbidity and mortality rates which accompanied the world's oldest profession. The contention that the slave family was undermined by the widespread promiscuity of blacks is as poorly founded as the thesis that masters were uninhibited in their sexual exploitation of slave women. Indeed, virtually no evidence other than the allegations of white observers has ever been presented that sustains the charge that promiscuity among slaves was greater than that found among whites. The question then arises, do the allegations reflect the reality of black behavior, or are they merely reflections on the preconceptions of the overseers? The allegations appeared creditable because they emanated not only from Southern defenders of slavery, but also from critics of the system. While the charges of Southerners could be set down as apologetics, one could not so easily dismiss the words of the abolitionists and other enemies of slavery. On the issue of promiscuity, the anti-slavery forces differed from the apologists, not in denying its existence, but in the explanation of its extent. Slavery, the critics believed, worked to exacerbate, rather than to hold in check, the carnal instincts of blacks. Unfortunately, abolitionists and other anti-slavery writers were not free of racism merely because they carried the banner of a moral struggle. With their greater physical separation from blacks, these writers were often more gullible and more quick in their acceptance of certain racial stereotypes than slaveholders. This, as we shall see, was a key factor in their underestimation of the efficiency of slave labor. Moreover, coming from the upper classes, as many of these writers did, they shared with slaveholders certain common conceptions regarding the behavior of all laboring folk. Thus, Fanny Kimball, whose descriptions of the family life of slaves is often quoted by historians, saw Irish peasants, English manufacturing workers, and American Negroes as all exhibiting the same recklessness toward human propagation. The available demographic evidence on slaves suggests a picture of their sexual lives and family behavior that has little in common with that conveyed by the allegations. One of the most revealing pieces of information is the pattern of child spacing among mothers between the ages of 18 and 30. For those whose children were stillborn or who died within the first three months, the averaged elapsed time until the birth of the next child was slightly more than one year. However, for those mothers whose children survived the first year of life, the elapsed time before the birth of the next child was somewhat over two years. This is the pattern of child spacing that one would expect to find in a non-contraceptive population in which mothers engaged in breastfeeding for the first year of their children's lives. For one of the effects of breastfeeding is to reduce the likelihood of conception. 
In other words, the pattern of child spacing among slaves suggests that the nursing of infants by their mothers was widespread. This finding hardly supports the charge that slave mothers were indifferent to their children, generally neglected them, or were widely engaged in infanticide. Quite the contrary, the ubiquity of the year-long pattern of breastfeeding, combined with the nearly identical rate of infant mortality among slaves and southern whites, and with the rare occurrences of suffocation and other accidents as the cause of death of infant slaves, suggests that, for the most part, black mothers cared quite well for their children. An even more telling piece of information is the distribution of the ages of mothers at the time of the birth of their first surviving child. This distribution, which is shown in figure 37, contradicts the charge that black girls were frequently turned into mothers at such tender ages as 12, 13, and 14. Not only was motherhood at age 12 virtually unknown, and motherhood in the early teens quite uncommon, but the average age at first birth was 22 and a half. The median age was 20.8. Thus, the high fertility rate of slave women was not the consequence of the wanton impregnation of very young unmarried women by either white or black men, but of the frequency of conception after the first birth. By far, the great majority of slave children were born by women who were not only quite mature, but who were already married. The high average age of mothers at first birth also suggests that slave parents closely guarded their daughters from sexual contact with men. For in a well-fed, non-contraceptive population in which women were quite fecund after marriage, only abstinence would explain the relative shortage of births in the late teen ages. In other words, the demographic evidence suggests that the prevailing sexual mores of slaves were not promiscuous, but prudish, the very reverse of the stereotype published by many in both the abolitionist and slaveholding camps and accepted in traditional historiography. Narratives collected from ex-slaves provide support for the prevalence of prudishness in the conduct of family life. Dim's Moral Times recollected Amos Lincoln, who was reared on a plantation in Louisiana. A gal's 21 for she marry. She didn't go wandering round all hours. They mammies know where they was. Folks nowadays is wild and weak. That marriage altered the sexual behavior of slaves is clearly indicated by the difference between the seasonal pattern of first births and that of second and subsequent births. See figure 38. Data culled from plantation records indicate that for second and subsequent births, roughly equal percentages of infants were born during every quarter of the year. But the seasonal pattern of first births shows a definite peak during the last quarter of the year, precisely the pattern to be expected in an agrarian society in which a large proportion of marriages took place soon after the harvest. Over twice as many births took place during the last quarter of the year, roughly 9 to 13 months after the end of the harvest, depending on the region and crop, as took place during the first quarter of the year. This pattern cannot be attributed merely to the fact that slaves had more leisure time during the winter interstice, and hence more opportunity for sexual intercourse. If that was all that had been involved, the peaking of births during the last quarter of the year would have occurred not only for first children, but for subsequent children as well. Also, fallacious is the contention that slave marriages, since they were arbitrarily dictated by masters, frequently produced odd age combinations. Young men married to old women and vice versa. Figure 39 shows that most marriages were contracted among partners quite close in age. The average age difference between husband and wife was just three years. In almost all cases, the man was the same age or older than the woman. Reversals in this pattern were quite uncommon. That slave life pivoted around stable nuclear families does not mean that the black family was merely a copy of the white family. 
no doubt the African heritage of blacks, as well as their particular socioeconomic circumstances, resulted in various characteristics, which were, if not restricted to, at least more frequent among black than white families. For example, various bits of evidence suggest that wives tended to play a stronger role in black than in white families. Careful delineation of such special characteristics and the determination of their incidence is a task which has not yet been adequately essayed. The evidence already in hand, however, clearly invalidates many of the generalizations that now permeate history books. It is not true that the typical slave family was matriarchal in form, and that the husband was at most his wife's assistant. Nor is it true that the male slave's only crucial function within the family was that of siring offspring. For better or worse, the dominant role in slave society was played by men, not women. It was men who occupied virtually all of the managerial slots available to slaves. There were very few female overseers or drivers. Men occupied nearly all the artisan crafts. Among them were carpentry, coopering, and blacksmithing. In the city of Charleston in 1848, for example, all of the 706 slave artisans were male. While females worked along with males in the field, their role was strictly delimited. Much has been made of the women who worked in plow gangs, but such participation was quite uncommon. Plow gangs were confined almost exclusively to men and predominantly to young men. During the period of cultivation, women worked along with older men and children in the hoe gangs, where strength was not so important a factor. Only at harvest time were women the equal of any man, since dexterity and not strength was the crucial characteristic of successful cotton picking. Just as some jobs on the plantation were confined strictly to men, others were confined strictly to women. Men were virtually never spinners, weavers, seamstresses, or nurses. The differentiation between male and female roles continued into the domestic staffs of plantations although the division was somewhat less sharp. Gardeners and coachmen were jobs for males, laundresses and cooks, female jobs. There was also a division of labor within the slave family, a division that began with courtship. It was the male who, at least on the surface, initiated the period of courtship, and it was the man who secured the permission of the planter to marry. After marriage, the tasks of cooking, ordinary household cleaning, laundering, and care of the children fell to the mother. Work in the garden patches of the slave household, hunting and fishing for extra food, and chopping wood were among the tasks of the father. Planters recognized husbands as the head of the family. Slave families were listed in their record books with the husband at the top of the list. Houses were assigned by the names of husbands, and the semi-annual issue of clothing to families were made in the name of the husband. Garden patches were assigned to the husbands, and the money earned from the sale of crops from these patches was held in his name. When slaves wanted advances of cash from these accounts, they were made to the men. Slave purchases of cloth and apparel, whether intended for men, women, or children, were charged against the names of the husbands, as were purchases of other items, as pails, pots, and special foods. While both moral convictions and good business practice generally led planters to encourage the development of stable nuclear families, it would be a mistake to assume that the black family was purely, or even predominantly, the creation of white masters. The exact interplay of external and internal forces in shaping the black family is still unknown, but there is considerable evidence that the nuclear form was not merely imposed on slaves, Slaves apparently abandoned the African family forms because they did not satisfy the needs of blacks who lived and worked under conditions in a society much different from those which their ancestors experienced. The nuclear family took root among blacks because it did satisfy those needs. Witness to the meaning which the family held for slaves is given by the deep anguish which they usually expressed on those occasions when their families were rent apart 
on the auction block. Well, they took us on up there to Memphis, and we was sold just like cattle, said Nancy Gardner, a former slave who lived in Oklahoma. They sold me and Ma together, and they sold Pa and Du Bois together. They was sent to Mississippi, and we was sent to Alabama. My Pa, oh, how my Ma was grieved to death about him. She didn't live long after that. During the relatively infrequent instances when economic forces led the planter to destroy, rather than to maintain slave families, the independent strivings of slaves to maintain their families came into sharp focus. Mrs. Josie Jordan, an ex-slave from Tennessee, reported to her mother that had two children while belonging to Mr. Clark, and he wouldn't let them go with Mammy and Pappy. That's what caused her misery. Pappy tried to ease her mind, but she just kept a crying for her babies, Anne and Reuben, till Mr. Lowry got Clark to leave them visit with her once a month. Further testimony to this striving is given by the ads, which planters placed in newspapers, advertising for the capture of runaways. These ads frequently indicated the planter's belief that his slave was attempting to reunite with the family from which the slave had been recently removed. The abolitionist position on the black family, which has been accepted so uncritically by historians, was strikingly inconsistent. To arouse sentiment against the slave system, they accurately portrayed the deep anguish which was caused by the forced breakup of slave families while simultaneously arguing that slavery had robbed black families of all meaning. This latter view was given vivid expression in Fanny Kebble's journal. The relationship between slave parents and children, she wrote, was reduced to the connection between the animal and its young. In her view, black families were stripped of all the unspeakable tenderness and solemnity, all the rational and all the spiritual grace and glory, which she associated with parenthood in upper-class English families. Under slavery, she concluded, parenthood became mere breeding, bearing, suckling, and there an end. The anguish on the auction block, as well as the struggle of blacks to reunite their severed families, both during and immediately after slavery, suggests that the love that permeated slave families eluded Fanny Kimball and most other white observers perhaps because of a veil of racial and class biases which obscured their vision and prevented them from seeing the real content of black family life. 